Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk. But to win big, you've got to reduce it. This episode is sponsored by ASTOTS Academy, which offers online courses that help investors, aspiring professionals, business leaders, and even beginners to improve the finances of their lives and their businesses. Go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now to claim your discount on the course that suits you most. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts, and I am here with featured guest, Larry Levine. Larry, are you ready to rock? Let's that's, that's get going. Let's get going, Andrew. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> I am too. I am too. So let me introduce you to the audience because... <laughs> There's something pretty cool about what you are doing. Larry Levine is the best-selling author of Selling from the Heart and the co-host of the Selling from the Heart podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, stop listening to this podcast right now and go search for Selling from the Heart podcast. Now, now that you're back, in a post-trust <laughs> sales world, Larry helps sales teams leverage the power of authenticity. I love that word to grow revenue, grow themselves, and enhance the lives of their clients. Larry has coached, coached sales professionals across the world from tenured reps to new millennials entering the sales force. They all appreciate his practical, real, raw, relevant, relatable, and street savvy nature of his coaching. Larry's not shy when it comes to delivering his message. In a world full of empty suits, Larry is passionate about helping sales reps succeed by helping them to uncover their true value before they get visible. Larry is leading a revolution of authenticity, integrity, and substance in the sales profession. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> How's that, Andrew? <laughs> Absolutely. And I know the audience just gave one. So, <laughs> yeah. Larry, take a minute. And hey, we, we can already tell how this podcast is going to go, right? We're going to Andrew? have some fun, man. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> I, I'm really excited and I want to learn more about you, but also I want to learn, I want to become better at sales. And I think you are the man to share. So take a minute and fill any further tidbits about your life. Uh, I always say this, I, I'm a sales nerd and a sports geek. I love everything about sales. Uh, I geek out on sales, anything about sales. I've grown up in the sales world my whole life. I, I love sports. There's always those tie-ins mm. between sports analogies and sales analogies. I could talk all day long about it. Um, I live in Southern California. I wake up at the ripe time of three o'clock in the morning, seven days a week. It works for me. Doesn't work for a lot of people, but it works for me. I learned a long time ago to capture the morning really well, and it helps kickstart your day. I didn't really realize that it was going to be three o'clock in the morning. It works for me. I, I, I love it. It gets my, I love the mornings. I love every single aspect of the morning. So I know the listeners are dying for me to ask this question. What time do you go to sleep? I go to sleep at the ripe early time of about 8.30. Okay, so you're single, no wife, no kids. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm happily married and I have three kids. And how do you manage that? Uh, it, it's interesting. Well, first of all, my kids are old. They're older and, and, you know, they're, for the most part, they're out of the house. Right. So I just, you know, even when, even when the kids were in the house, Andrew, I still, I, we, I made it work. Mm. I, I, I just, I just figured out, I remember a long time ago, an old mentor of mine shared some of the best advice I had when I was in my younger days, find out when your brain works the best and capitalize on it. And I just found out that my brain works the best at extreme early times in the morning till about early to mid afternoon. And then after that, it starts fading. So I try to get all my, all the work I do on myself, all my career work, everything that I did in sales, I always tried to do early in the morning till mid part in the afternoon. So uh, I'm going to tell you a funny story is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of coaches out there and executive coaches and all that. May, maybe 15 years ago, a young guy came to me and he said, I'm, I'm going to coach you. And I was like, uh, I'm pretty productive, but you know, no, no, I can get you results and all that. And I said, look, most important thing that I just want to tell you 
is please don't tell me to get up an hour earlier because I'm already waking up at 4 a.m. But now I learn maybe his advice was right. I should have gotten up at three and then I could have been even more successful. But you and I have that in common. I wake up without an alarm clock every day at about roughly 4 a.m. And I either start work or I exercise. You know, work I love to do, exercise I don't love to do. So I try to do it in the morning. And it's such a great feeling when I have ridden my bicycle, for instance, around the neighborhood or around the city of Bangkok when there's nobody out. And then at like five in the afternoon, I'm walking through the city and I walk by a place. I think, yeah, did I exercise this morning? Oh, yeah, I did. It's already done. <laughs> So yeah. I love capturing the morning too. I do it every day. And so I, I just love that. And for the listeners out there, you know, morning time may not be your time, but for me and obviously for Larry, it is the time to capture our energy. Yeah. yeah I, and, and, and it's so true because I, I just, I've, I've tried to trick my brain, Andrew, and I'll try to go, okay, Larry, what would it be like if you just didn't do it? Right. What would happen if you woke up at four? And you, and so you actually slept in for an hour and then you didn't do what you did at three. And all of a sudden it, it plays on my mind. And, and I feel, sometimes I feel guilty. Gosh, I actually slept in till four o'clock. I missed an hour because I'm, <laughs> totally I'm, not. Such, I'm such a routine oriented guy. I was like that in my sales career that I go, okay, well, I just lost an hour of productivity. So now, you know, I have a sickness, right? So yes. So let's just, uh, before we go into the question, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about the journey of how you ended up with this book, but also why should the le listeners, you know, get this book? What are they going to get from it? I mean, come on, there's lots of books about sales and selling. What is it about yours that really can bring value to the listener? Um. I, I think the biggest thing is I, I'm going to, I'm going to take everyone on a quick journey, but it'll be a quick journey. And then it'll, and then I'll share, you know, why the book and, and what, why it came to be. I spent 28 years in probably the most chaotic, dysfunctional backwards sales channel, in my opinion, that's ever existed. I sold copiers in Los Angeles, my whole entire career. It's brutal. It's cutthroat. It's dog eat dog. It's highly commoditized, but that's the channel that I chose. I didn't expect to be in this, right? I didn't expect to parlay, you know, a 28 year sales career in copiers. I expected to stay in it a year and parlay that into something else. But I, I'm a big believer that a lot of people are products of how they were raised. And I was raised in a generation where my parents were raised the same way. You find a job, you find a career and you stay in it and you don't job hop. Mm. And I remember that early on in my career, I go, man, you know, I, I kind of chose sales and I chose this crazy world of selling copiers. There's no way I could go back and try to do something else because I'd let my father down. So what I did is I just doubled down on myself and I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to do the, I'm going to create the best possible situation for me. And I learned the difference, and this is early on in, in my career, I learned the difference between sales reps and sales professionals because I had a very inquisitive mindset. But I share this with you because throughout my whole 28 year career, I was on some pretty dysfunctional sales teams with dysfunctional managers. And I, can, and I remember this as plain as day, Andrew, there was not one manager I had, not one leader so to speak, that ever helped me become the best version of myself. All the training that I had, all the workshops that I went to was always to enhance the skill set of my career. It hmm. was never to enhance me. So I had a life altering moment at 50. And we can get into that in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. But when I decided to, to write Selling from the Heart, it was to bring me to the forefront. It was to bring sincerity, substance, and heart to us, to a profession that's got a black eye, that lacks trust, that lacks credibility, that lacks integrity. And the way I wrote the book was this, is the first half of Selling from the Heart is all about working on yourself. I'm bringing to the forefront the things that nobody helped me do, I figured out for myself. That if I didn't do the inner work, if I, didn't, if I wasn't 
if I didn't self-reflect, that's by the way, reason, one of the reasons I get up so early is I work a lot on myself and my mind that if you can self-reflect, become self-aware of who you are and work on the inner part of who we are, it fuels your outer success. And that's when I go, you know what? I'm bringing this to the forefront. It's long overdue. I'm going to push the message on sincerity, substance, and heart in the sales profession. And I'm going to, I'm going to really encourage people. You got to work on yourself. If you fail to work on yourself, it's going to hamper you from becoming the best version of yourself. And somewhere down the road, your sales career, whatever career you're in will not, will not be fulfilled until you work on yourself. There's a lot of things. I, I think one of the things uh, that I would like to mention is just the fact that uh, my father graduated with a PhD in organic chemistry and he went to work for DuPont. And when he did, it was, you know, an opportunity of a lifetime to work in the labs in the, you know, in the early 60s. And for those people listening that remember the movie, The Graduate, it was Dustin Hoffman. And the guy that said to him was, you know, what's the future? And he said, plastics. <laughs> and that was my dad was literally right at the beginning of that. And then my dad decided that he really enjoyed working with people much more. And then he became a salesman and he became a salesman that knew the technical aspects of the, the, the products, plastics products. And then we moved to Ohio and started selling plastics to the car companies and you know others. And my dad built a career in sales and put me through school and, and had a great retirement and with my mom and had a happy life. When I came to Thailand, it's interesting that there really isn't a sales culture. In fact, sales is kind of just looked down on as people dragging things through villages, trying to, you know, schlep their wares mm -hmm. basically. And I realized in, in one of the businesses that I have in Thailand, you know, it's hard for all of our businesses to get people to sell because because of the fact that it feels like, oh, it's not that sincere or whatever. Now, of course, my dad, you know, I, from a young age, I saw him sell in an in a institutional framework, let's say, not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, B to C or something like that. But, you know, I'm just curious about that, you know, for, for countries like in Asia, where selling is really not a respected profession, why should it be? Well, you bring up a real, you bring up a fascinating point because it, it, it's so interesting sales. If you ask, if, if you, if you ask most people, they're going to go, why do you even get into sales? Sales is such a dirty word. But to me, I believe everybody's in sales without selling. What do you think happens to the economy? Right. We must sell things. Right. When, when, and, um, it was, it was so interesting. I have a friend of mine who's a hedge fund manager and he buys and sells companies and things like that. And he said, when money stops moving through the economy at the rate that it used to, the way that it's going to get back to where it is, is you got to sell things. Yeah. And, and sales to me, sales is the art of the help. But what's happened is, and this is where I'll, I'll point the finger back in salespeople and sales leaders in general, is they've created this perception. Mm. And I'm a big believer, Andrew, perception's reality, and rightfully so, is if you ask, you know, ask 100 people, they're going to give you 100 of the same responses. They have no respect for salespeople, right? They're liars, cheaters, snake oil salespeople, and rightfully so. It doesn't have to be that way. And that's why a lot, I write in my book a lot about the difference between a sales rep and a sales professional. And there's a huge difference, but it's what you do to carry yourself and how you change perception and what you personally do. I, I knew this for 28 years, I was in sales. I control what I can control. And that's how I go to market, interact with people and change their perception of salespeople. Mm. And I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing about sales that when companies start, let's say startups and others, and they try to get out there and sell, it's all about, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get salespeople to think about how can I make this client's life better with my product? Or maybe my product doesn't make this person's life better and there's a better product out there. But the idea of thinking about, think about it from their perspective, because I often say to 
the thing about sales, it's, it's really the only career that is a truly emotional roller coaster. It's the only career where you have to reveal yourself for the rejection that must come as you, you know, proceed through the calls and things that you have to do. There is no other one that I can come up with that has that day-to-day -day raw. It's almost like a, a general in an army is, is behind the troops, but those infantry men and women are on the front line taking the hits. And that's really how I see sales. But I'm just curious how you think about it. No, as I say, I, I, I write about it. I said sales is a full contact sport. Full contact sport. You're going to get knocked down. You got to pick yourself back up. You're going to get told no a lot more than you're going to be told yes. And I remember I took rejection personally for years and for decades. I took it personally because I always wanted to be the best. And I go, man, if Andrew told me no, maybe it's something I did, right? Mm. But more often than not, it's no, it wasn't directed at me. It was the message or how I delivered it. Yeah. I just didn't earn the right. And I started and I, I just started to reverse engineer all this. But we just have to learn that rejection is not personal, but we take it personal. <laughs> it's hard not to. It's it, 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 it's hard not to. You're, no, you're absolutely right. But that's why, you know, I'm a big believer. This is a, my, I, I, there's three things I, I love discussing. I held myself to a high degree of standards with this and it helped me with it is I'm a big believer in mindset, skill set, and heart set. And it's a, it's a triangle that's connected. We must always be working on our mind. We almost, we always must be working on our heart and we always must be enhancing our skill set. Because when we work on our heart and our mind, when we're told no, we don't take it personal. It's just no, not right at this moment. I need to provide a better reason for you to say yes. <laughs> uh, there's just so much to discuss about it, but I think we're going to continue that discussion. So let's get into the question of this podcast. And that is, it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, Tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. So, okay. So, I mean, I got a lot of them, but this, but this is, this is, this is an investment I made recently and it, and it wasn't, it's not a financial investment, Andrew, but it's a, it's a career investment. I was with, I was with the same company. I helped start a company here in the LA marketplace in 1994. And I stayed there all the way until 2013 and 2000, I bought into the company. And then we rapidly expanded throughout the Los Angeles marketplace. Well, 2012, I noticed that it's just, I sensed it was a sixth sense. It was time for me to move on. It started to become toxic. Um, it can became dysfunctional and it was just, maybe it was just time. So I sold, I sold my shares of the company back and I hung on for about another eight months. And then I decided, you know what, now it's time to exit. But I knew that mentally a year and a half before, and I knew if I sold my shares back then, I would have made an easy career exit when the time was right. So I made that exit after almost 20 years with the same company. I poured a lot of you know, blood, sweat, and tears into the company, and then I made a career investment going somewhere else. And I decided it was time for me to go from a small, mid-sized company to a large corporation. So big I made the, the big leagues, right? So I made the investment in myself, but I made the investment in the person who brought me to that company. And this was the summer of 2013. And I walked into a brand new situation, right? I left 20 years behind me and I invested in a brand new situation in a brand new corporation on a corporate major account team. And now I hear I am the newbie on a corporate major account team. I was number 18 on an 18 person corporate major account team in downtown Los Angeles. And all of a sudden I walk into this place the summer of 2013, they give me this exorbitantly high quota for the year. And they said, by the way, we're not gonna give you any current customers. It's all brand new business. Welcome to insert name of company. <laughs> I go, holy, you know what? What did I just walk into? 
but I doubled down on myself because I was always investing in my career. Well, I believed in what I could do and I invested in this person who brought me over. And for 90 days, it was a rough roller coaster. But then I took everything that I've learned and I've hold myself to a high degree of standards. And I rose in one year from number 18 to number two. I built out a million and a half dollars of brand new business, got all the way up to number two. And then in the spring of 2015, at 50 years old, I was fired. That's the corporate world. That's the corporate world. But it was the investment that I made in myself is the investment that I made in somebody else that I trusted. And then all of a sudden, you know what? I just got dealt the you know what. And at 50 years old, the spring of 2015, I find myself for the first time ever without a job. Oh. And when I think about the rejection that a salesperson faces every day, Personally, I know the feeling that a man feels when you lose your livelihood. And of course, women who are working also feel the same way, but there's something about a man <clears throat> derives um, self-confidence, a sense of meaning from their work. I guess if you go back to caveman times, you know, our work was providing for the family. And you know, so I know that feeling. So tell us what happened next. So, you know, we talked we, just a little bit ago, we talked about rejection, right? And, and we talked about accepting no. Well, guess what? This was the hardest rejection I ever had in my whole life. I took this one really, really personal. I cried for days, literally cried for days. I had to figure out what do I do with myself at 50 years old? Do I go back? Do I go back and do what I was used to doing, which is the only thing that I knew how to do? I came out of the office technology world. I sold copiers my whole life. Do I just go back, right? Do I bite the bullet? Do I go back to the old company that I sold my shares back to and right, get on my hands and knees and say, hey, you know what? Will you welcome me back? Which I knew they would have taken me back. Do I go to a different company and be a vice president of sales? and ride off into a complacent sunset. And I mean, those are all the, uh, the options don't feel good. I no, mean, and, and I'm options. like going, man, I go, you know what? Somehow I'd just rather be unemployed than go back to some of those, right? But I, re I remember having a conversation with my wife and I go, just give me 45 days, give me 45 days to figure this out. And the response was, hey pal, you don't have 45 days to figure this out. You got to figure this out. We got mouths to feed. We exactly. So I, I started to dip into my network and I started to ask my network for help. I went right to my closest friend at the time, picked up the phone and I said, hey, this is what happened. I was fired from my job. I'm, hey, I'm out there on the market now. Do you know anybody? I'm tapping your network. I'm asking for help. Mm. About two days later, my, my cell phone rings. It's my very near and dear friend who two days before I kind of shared what had happened. This person says, Larry, he goes, you got to go back out into the corporate world and you got to coach salespeople on what made you so successful in a dysfunctional, chaotic sales channel. Have you ever thought about becoming a sales coach and trainer? I said, heck no, right? There's no way. There's no way I could do this. I tried managing once and I was horrible at it. But I remembered something that just always stuck in the back of my head. And what drove me in sales and what drives me still to this day is you had mentioned that your, your dad was a chemical engineer, right? Mm -hmm. My dad was an aeronautical engineer. My dad was a rocket scientist excuse me, was a rocket scientist for the United States Air Force. My dad had a PhD in aeronautical physics from two Ivy League schools by the time he was 20 years old. That's what I had to grow up with. 
and I got into sales. So the whole time in sales, I had to look at myself and go, am I good enough, right? And so I pushed myself and I pushed myself. And now at 50, right, I have no job. I got to go now tell my dad at 50 years old, guess what, dad? I don't have a job. So what drove me then is I said, you know what? I took my friend's advice and I said, I'm going to double down on myself. and I'm going to show my dad that I can do something different. And I said, okay, I'll do this. And I went out, I invested in myself and I started to coach. I went right back into the sales channel that I knew. And I started to coach office technology reps on the things that made me, me in the copier channel. And three and a half years ago, as we're recording this, I said, you know what? I want to bring selling from the heart to the forefront because that was Larry Levine. I wore my emotions on my sleeves. I connected deeply and I built meaningful relationships with my clients. What would that be like if I brought that to the forefront? And in three and a half years, I started a podcast. Uh, I wrote Selling from the Heart. It's opened some massive doors all over the world. The message is resonating like no tomorrow, but it's because you know, sometimes you have setbacks in life, Andrew, and those setbacks in life will actually propel you forward. I made, you know, I made an investment years ago when I started a company and then I sold. I made an investment in myself and I made an investment in a friend who brought me to a corporate setting. Well, it didn't work out. But instead of crying about it, I did. I just picked myself up and I said, I'll double down on myself. And I dove into the deep end of entrepreneurship. I, I tell people I was a forced entrepreneur. I didn't choose this, right? I was forced into it. Which is a lot of people in that situation right now with COVID, that the thing they were doing, it just doesn't exist anymore. I'm sorry, it's painful, but it's time to reinvent. And I think that's you know a great message coming from what you're talking about. No, you, you use a word that's near and dear to me, reinvent. I love RE words. And, you know, it was whether it's re-engineer or reinvent or get reacquainted or re-educate. There's no better time than right now to do that. And sometimes, right, we just get, we just get dealt the proverbial, you know what? Mm -hmm. And we got to learn how to deal with it. I mean, at, you know, I, I could have just, I could have just crumbled and then just spiraled downhill, but I chose to double down on myself and reinvent myself. I always share with people, we all have aha moments. It's what we learn from them, whether that be a bad career investment, whether that be a bad financial investment, we all get those aha moments, but we got to pick ourselves up and we got to dust ourselves off and we got to just push forward. I, I got a question on this before we get into you know, um, what you learn from this experience. And that is, I, I kind of want to go back in time when your friend said to you, hey, you should really coach people, you know, salespeople. How did it go with the first approach? Because I think that there's a lot of executives, no matter what you are, sales, marketing, management, that, that do consider getting coaches. But I mean, people are like, <clears throat> oh, it's a lot of money. Or what benefits it's going to bring? This guy's just going to make me work harder. <clears throat> or I don't want to deal with that or whatever. I'm just curious if we can go back in time for your first couple of pitches to the first people that you approach to say, Hey, I'm going to, I want to work with you. And here's how, here's what we do. Tell us just a bit about how that went. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big believer and I, I'm going to, I'm going to flip this around on you just for a second, right. but it's going to answer your question is I'm a big believer. Stories sell. Stories are powerful. And I always say the best storytellers are story collectors. Stop and think about that for a second. The best storytellers are story collectors. So what I did is I collected in my memory bank stories. And I repurposed my stories in front of sales leaders. I still remember, I'll tell you a quick funny story, Andrew. It was two weeks after I was let go that I find myself for the first time speaking in front of a group of people. My very first 
speaking engagement. I'm two weeks into being let go. And that first speaking engagement is in front of 500 people. Okay. 500 people. My friend had set this up, right? <laughs> it was at a technology event. Gave me the best piece of advice. He goes, Larry, he goes, all I want you to do is go up on stage and tell your story. Tell your story how you walked into this corporation with no customers and build out what you build. I promise you, just tell that story for 45 minutes. It's all you got to do. And I go, okay, I've never spoken in front of 500 people in my life, Andrew. I get up on stage. I tell my story for 45 minutes. I have two executives that were in the crowd walk up to me, go, Larry, your story was freaking fascinating. Can you train my salespeople on what you just said? <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, I can. Tomorrow or when Wednesday? Can you start? They go, when can you start? Sometimes it's the right place at the right time. But to answer your question is I'm a big believer story sell. Yep. I just shared stories that resonated. I'm a big believer words matter and message matters. And it was from that speaking engagement that it opened up other opportunities. And from there, it, I just went back to repurposing that story. And I started to uncover what sales issues that sales leaders were having. And I went back to my memory bank of the stories I collected and repurposed those. And that's how I, that's how I flipped the script on all of this. It's interesting. I mean, <clears throat> there's so many things that we have in common, like the waking up early, the backgrounds of our fathers working for one institution all their lives and, you know, uh, the educations of our fathers and all of that. But this, the idea of stories is also something, I mean, I literally, <clears throat> I speak out stories into my uh, computer and then it um, transcribes those. And I have a collection of stories that I've, that, that, that convey different, you know, messages that I want to convey. Um, one of the stories <clears throat> that I convey in relation to a particular course that I teach is that I was asked to give a speech in the Philippines and they flew me down from Thailand to the Philippines a few years ago. My speech was in the afternoon and it was to a small audience of a bigger audience. My audience was 900 people. The biggest, bigger audience was 2000 people. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> I did a lot of preparation for that um, event. And I arrived in my mind, as I say, it was in the afternoon, but I normally, you know, arrive a couple hours before, but I decided since they flew me in, I ought to at least go to the whole event. So I went and I arrived, it was about nine, nine thirty or so. And um, I texted and I saw the lady that, that invited me and she was up in the front and she came back to the back to see me. And I was like, um, she brought out the, the head of the whole event. And um, I said, how are you guys doing? And they said, terrible. And I said, why? And they said, because in, in one hour from now, we have our keynote speaker and he's just called to tell us that he has to take his mother to the hospital and he can't make it. And we have 2000 people waiting for his speech in an hour and and, and I asked them, can I help? And they said, can you give a speech on ethics in finance? I said, if you can get one of your staff into the VIP room with a notebook computer, I'll get on the phone with my staff, pull together the, the work that I have on that. And I said, and in one hour, I'll be ready to get on stage. And in one hour, I got on stage and rocked that audience of 2000 people. And then I gave my speech in the second half, you know, in, in the afternoon uh -huh. of the day, the one I was already prepared for. So the point that I make from that is that, you know, what I, I teach, one of my courses is how to give a great presentation. And what I've learned is a lot of tip, tricks and tips of ways to engage the audience, to, to do these things that make it so that you can speak anytime, anywhere. And uh, that is a story to explain why someone should attend my course how to become a great presenter <laughs> so it's so good it, it, it's just so i mean it's so interesting how much we have in common but you know i i'm a massive believer in this and why still to this day i love telling stories as humans it's how we connect and relate to people we have grown up for decades and years and centuries go all the way back to cave people they all connected based on stories exactly 
And it's why is why that I use the R words a lot in these things that, you know, I talk about real and relevant and relatable. People yep. want to yep. know, hey, are you connected to the message, right? Are you real? Are you somebody I can relate to? Are you relevant? Are you a practitioner of what you say? Yep. You know, I think we've got to pause for a moment because I want to switch now and talk to the audience. For those of you listening right now, I would suggest that you take a moment, pause this podcast and either record on your phone or write down with a piece of paper, a few of your stories of things that happened to you and lessons that you learned from them. Get those stories written down. If you don't have time to do the whole story, no problem, just list out those stories. Just take a moment. And I believe that this is one of the big lessons that Larry's bringing to all of us is get your stories together. So Larry, tell us what, what lessons did you learn from this experience? Yeah, uh, that I was, I, I think the biggest thing is I was capable of doing a lot more than I thought I ever was. And, and, and I, and I, and I say this wholeheartedly at, there's no way. So at, just so you know, as we're recording this right now, I'll be 56 years old tomorrow. And which is actually the 19th where you're at. I'm still on the 18th of November as we're recording this. Mm. But there's no way if I look back over the last five and a half years of my life, there's no way that if you and I are having this conversation at 49 years old and you said, hey, Larry, what would you be doing at 55, 56 years old? There's no way on earth I would tell you exactly what I'm doing right now. But the big the biggest thing that I've learned is I'm capable of doing a whole heck of a lot more than I ever thought. The other thing is, is the more uncomfortable I got over the last five years, the better I became. I'm doing things <laughs> now that there's no way I would have ever thought I was doing three years ago. There's no way I would have started a podcast, but I doubled down on myself. And, and I really wanted your listeners to really key in on this because I've said it before, is words matter and message matters. You ask people to pause the podcast and write their story. I'm a big believer. Everybody has a story and it needs to be told. It's how we tell the story. Mm -hmm. Biggest takeaways is, is I just learned that all the stories of my life that I played out are now coming true, that I'm capable of doing a whole lot more. Your listeners are capable of doing a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. And if, we, if there's anything that I've learned in 2020 and through all the chaos that's happened is double down on yourself and double down on how uncomfortable you get. The more uncomfortable you get, the more comfortable it will become. You know, <clears throat> the Bangkok airport, it is, it is a north-south runway. And at, at the majority of the times of the years, the takeoff is happening to the south. But at this time of year, the takeoff switches and they take off to the north. But why do they do that? Because the winds from China are more powerful than the winds from the Indian Ocean and the monsoon winds that come up. And the point is you simply cannot lift a plane into, into no wind. And you can't lift a plane with wind coming at your back. And so to talk about a reword resistance is what really, you know, that's my first takeaway of this. What you've shared is the idea of being uncomfortable, facing resistance. It is this resistance that forces us to change and look for the new option. And <clears throat> the second thing, you know, I, I just had brief tears in my eyes for a moment because you said I'm capable of doing a lot more than, you know, I was doing. And <clears throat> my business partners gave me a picture of Muhammad Ali standing over um, Sonny Liston, you know, uh -huh. the famous, the famous knockout when he became the youngest heavyweight champion of the world. And they, they superimposed my face on top of Muhammad Ali's. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I have the only existing, you know, white face picture of Muhammad Ali, but <clears throat> that, that they put a saying next to it says, my only regret is that I didn't realize I was capable of so much more. 
And, you know, that's, you're a reminder of that. So for all the listeners out there, embrace the resistance, embrace the disaster, the frustration and the emotion, and then use it to, you know, propel yourself. I think the other thing that the last thing that I would say that I took away from what you've shared is the idea, I'm going to, I'm going to just call it, keep it simple, you know, we get all complicated about what we're going to do for business and for our career. And we make all these plans, but you've just brought it back to the fact that just bring your stories, bring your sincerity. Stories are authentic. If authenticity works. So keep it simple. You don't need some fancy, uh, you know, mumbo jumbo. What you need is real authentic stories. And, you know, just to, to support what, what you're saying, you know, I was, when I was looking at the reviews of your book, you've got 140 reviews right now on Amazon and it's 4.9 out of five. That is, you know, I very rarely achieved. And so for the audience, for everybody listening, what I would highly recommend is to embrace your, you know, your pain and your struggle and then bring your story to the world and you'll, you, you never know where it can take you. And I think Larry's a great example. Anything you'd add to that? Yeah. I always say, you know, you said the embrace word. I always say embrace the suck, right? We never know when that aha moment's going to happen. We, we, did, we, just ne- we just never know. But, but I, I will leave that this is one of my favorite sayings. I use it all the time. I end videos that I do with this is sincerity, substance, and heart will set you apart. I don't care what career you're in, whether you're in sales, whether you're in finance, whether you're a teacher, a banker, you work as a clerk in a grocery store. If you all bring sincerity, true sincerity, if you bring substance and you bring your heart to the forefront, it will not only change yourself, it will change the conversations you have and it'll forever change the relationships you have with yourself your friends, your family, and out in the marketplace. All right, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Number one goal for the next, so, okay, I'm, I'm going to clue you in because this, there's actually, there's nobody who knows it. You're the first one to just really know about it. My goal for 2021 is there will be another Selling from the Heart 2 book coming out. I just started to rough outline it yesterday as we're recording this the outline will be done by the midpoint of december and i'll be writing second selling from the heart come january and that's one big goal is to continue off of selling from the heart the first book so ladies and gentlemen if you drive by larry's house and you see a light on at 3 a.m in the morning you know for the next 365 days it will be writing out that book (laughs) <laughs> hey, hey so, you're, so as i'm listening to what you're saying so the, okay so now this is the only thing that goes through my head so it's like I, I got a warped mind as i'm listening to what you're saying i had flashes of the twilight zone like going through my head <laughs> ladies and gentlemen <clears throat> well i know when i did my uh, phd which i i finished my phd at 50 uh, I know it took seven months and i every morning for the first three hours of every morning, I focus on that before I went into my work. So if anybody's out there listening that wants to write a book is in the process of writing a book, you know, make sure you to capture that morning time. If you're a morning person to capture the most productive time that you have, block it off, focus in on it and consistently contribute to that time you know, and and do your core work in that and things will be amazing. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of laws to keep you winning. Remember to go to myworstinvestmentever.com to claim your discount on the course that excites you the most. Maybe even the course about how to become a great presenter. As we conclude, Larry, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Yeah, hey, hey, real quick, do I get a diploma for this, Andrew? Yeah, it's coming. Is it, is it coming in the mail? It's do, coming. Can I get one? You can just yeah, send me yeah. one digitally. I'll print it out and put it on my wall. Amen. You got it. <laughs> huh. Sorry, I just had to say that before I split. I couldn't yep. resist. You're getting it.
It's all, no, it's all good. It's coming. All right. Well, that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our wealth. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want a diploma like Larry's got, <laughs> get in touch with me. Come on the show and share. I dare you to share your worst investment ever. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast. Host Andrew Stotts saying that I'll see you on the upside.